up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bookmark. I'm your host, Sherry Joy. I am half of the DigiCast, and welcome to my show. This is part two of book six, Now I See You, the Mountain Murder Mystery Series, book one of five by Shannon Work. Uh, before we continue, I would just like to take a moment and ask you to pause right now and like and subscribe to our channel, the DigiCast One, on YouTube, and as well as this show, this this um, episode here, <laughs> among others. Please like and subscribe. Thank you to all of our subscribers and all of our followers. We truly appreciate you and we appreciate your support. And this is a full-on spoiler show and I am discussing part two the second half of the book so um, if you have not listened to the first half of this book I do recommend listening to book six part one and then coming back and obviously listening to part two of book six and if you are interested in reading the book I am doing full-on spoilers I am talking about the actual book itself what's going on in the book my perspective my guesses my theories um, so I do suggest that you stop right now if you want to read the book and go read the book it is a really good book very well written and um, then come back and listen to the show but if not you want to continue or if you've already read the book then welcome aboard okay so Whew, now I see you. So this was totally written, I, well, maybe not written as a whodunit, but I am getting whodunit vibes here. There are so many characters. There are a lot of twists. There are a lot of characters who could be the culprit here. And, um, <laughs> I mean, let's, let's uh, get to it. So where we first left off, let's see, just to do a quick, quick recap, recap. Georgia Glass is an investigative reporter from Denver, Colorado. She um, just left her job there at a, at a news company there to pick up a new job in LA. So she's traveling from Denver to LA and she actually learns that uh, she inherited this Victorian, this beautiful Victorian home in Aspen, Colorado from her uncle who was recently deceased. He is a former detective of the town and so she goes to Aspen to look at her inheritance and to check out the house and everything and clean it up to figure out what she wants to do. Does she want to stay there? Does she, well, not stay there, but does she want to keep the home and, you know, make it her vacation home? Does she want to sell the home, rent it out? What does she want to do? And meanwhile, um, so her contractor comes and they find a body of a woman, Rachel Winston, in her garage that's detached. So there is a serial person out there who is unaliving people on purpose by strangulation. Um, so that's where, you know, we were with that book. So we've got quite a few characters here. Her realtor, his name is Jonathan. And he has been working closely with her on, you know, her home. She does decide she wants to keep it and she's going to fix it up. It's a very beautiful home. The, the structure is gorgeous, you know, original Victorian. So she wants to give it some tender love and care and make it her vacation home. Um, and Jonathan, you know, he's, he's helps her with that. She's also working with a contractor. His name is Kramer and Carl Kramer actually. And we don't really learn any more about him. He's like not relevant in the book anymore at this point. But halfway through the book, like I said, at the end of part one, we are still being introduced to new characters. So there's just so many. Um, all right. So Edward or Eddie Jenkins, he is, he was Georgia's cameraman in Denver. He worked with the news um, there and he's a weird kind of guy, kind of short, I guess, for a man. He's got like frilly hair and a big bushy beard and he's kind of got a standoffish approach uh, visually, but we learn that he's actually a nice guy. Um, you know, once you get to know him, he's pretty funny. He's outgoing. He's very nice. He became very, very close with Georgia. Um, I mean, they worked together. She was, he was her cameraman. So he really appreciates Georgia and looks up to her. She, you know, befriended him and is kind of like the only one at the station that's really nice to him. 
So, you know, he does appreciate that. And, you know, we, when we meet his, when we meet him, he's actually going to the studio to pick up his tools because he's going to set up some security equipment in Georgia's new home or in Georgia's Aspen home because she is being stalked. Did set up the security system in her home in Denver when she was being stalked by who we thought was Palladino. He went to jail for stalking her and then now he's in maximum security prison because while he was in jail he actually uh unalived on purpose a security guard in in the jail so now he's in maximum security prison facing for that. Uh so yeah so Eddie he he gets into get his security stuff or his tools and he overhears some of the new he overhears the new person who took George's place talking to another newscaster and then creepy he is and how horrible his beard is and it looks you know disgusting and they're just talking to him not talking to him but making fun of him and Eddie hears this and he gets like very very up and he makes himself known you know, once they're done talking, he's like, hey, ladies, and it's obvious, he makes it obvious, and it's obvious to them that he overheard them. So he kind of did that on purpose, because he wanted to make them feel like crap, like how he feels, but it still upset him. So he's, he, once he gets his tools, he goes in his car, he's got an old beat up Subaru, and he, you know, he heads to Aspen with his tools to set up the security system. And he's like, all right, well, you know, I'm driving down this and I know the way because I've been there four times this week. So that right there makes me think that he is the stalker. We don't know for sure, but just with that, you know, him saying that he's been there four times this week already, it really does make me think that he is the stalker. I mean, Georgia has said that she or she she sees somebody in like this white van and she can't see his face. He's got a hoodie on and, you know, he's like kind of hiding his face every time he passes her like on her road or something like that. But she has ran into this strange van, this person in this strange van a couple of times. So after, you know, after that, he does go and he sets up the security camera in her house once he gets there. And he takes like all day, they have some Chinese food and they kind of talk about, you know, life. And she's telling him about the situation of her being stalked. And then he notices some papers that she's doing. And he's like, oh, are you doing some investigating? And she's like, yeah, there's this um, serial person in the 50s, you know, uh, Tumei, who was unaliving people on purpose. He was strangling women on purpose in the 50s. So she's kind of like reading up on that because of all of the, the two women who have been strangled in Aspen thus far in the present day. So she's talking to him about that. And then she, you know, he's like, all right, well, I'm going to get to work after they eat there. And so he gets to work. <laughs> he sets up her cameras. But what he doesn't tell her is that he did set up a camera inside of her living room. So it's like, yeah, you're the stalker for sure, buddy. But why? Um, and what else is he? So then we go on and we meet another character. Her name is Liz Kelly. She is a reporter in the tabloid from a tabloid uh, magazine or whatever newspaper magazine from Denver. And her, her, um, magazine or newspaper is called the national tattler <laughs> how like cliche is that so ridiculous but sure um so she's there she's in aspen because she hears about these strangulations and of course she wants the story for herself so she goes and um she goes to aspen and she she's going she's down in the lobby or you know in the dining area of the hotel that she's staying in apparently there's like this one hotel called the Jerome that everybody stays at. I don't know. And I've never been to Aspen. I'm getting the impression from this book that Aspen is small. I don't know if that's accurate. I've never been there. I don't plan on going there, but you never know. Could win the lottery. So she's having dinner or she's having her breakfast and she sees this guy who looks like a local, like he looks like money, right? 
but also he seems to be a local because the waitress knows him and knows exactly wants to, what he wants to eat. I guess he gets the same thing every day. So we learn that his name is actually Stanley Lauren, who was there at the Winston party when Rachel went missing. So um, yeah, Liz goes, you know, she schmoozes her way over. She uses her, her reporter tactics to kind of get more information from him and to see what he's going to give up. You know, what is he going to say? So he basically, he tells her about the party and the, what's been going on about the town and the who's who of everybody and not really too much, you know, interesting. I mean, there's interesting things there, but it's stuff that we already know from the book thus far. And so while he's talking to her, she she made it seem like she is from New York and she's in town interested in purchase, purchasing a home. But she and she's like writing all this information down in her notepad and everything underneath the table that he can't see. So they have that conversation. And then on the other side of town, back, you know, back to Georgia, she's still getting these like taunting notes. Like, you think you can hide from me? Ha ha ha. You can't. And <laughs> just, you know, it's like, wow. You know, then, then she's getting like um, clippings, like photocopies of the scrapbook clippings that her uncle kept in the home of Tume and all of those, you know, strangulations back in the 50s and remember the actual serial person of today took that scrapbook from the vacant home before Georgia got there so that's you know kind of weird but kind of also interesting so she's got she's got she's being stalked by getting photos of herself in different places and she's also getting stalked by what we believe is a different person is the serial person who's taunting her about your investigation and here's all these clippings and here's another one and you think you can catch me and you know that type of thing so it's it's almost like two different things going on here so we already know that the serial person wants to strangle Georgia and so he's sending her these taunting, um, get ready, you know, why you could be next type things. And then also, like I said, she's getting these other photos of herself, like in a different kind of stalking, like a prey type of thing. It's, it, it all comes through to the end, but <laughs> you just, just bear with me. So, okay. So remember Dr. Um, Murphy, Thomas Murphy, he's the weird guy who's the, um, a psychologist from the hospital, the chief of staff, the the chief of staff doctor at the hospital in Manhattan. He fantasizes about Georgia and how beautiful she is, and she's got porcelain skin. And then he's like imagining him with her, his hands all over her face and feeling her facial features. And then her, his hands are going down to her beautiful porcelain neck. And then that kind of, that fantasy ends, like the chapter just ends. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then back in Denver, the police officer, um, Mark, he talks to Palladino and Palladino, he, he like interrogates him while he's visiting him in prison to ask him more about the stalking. And Palladino admits that he actually unalived his parents. He unalived his father because his father was, you know, abusive, verbally abusive and just, you know, was a bad guy and was a bad father. And then the then Mark is like, well, why did you unalive your mother? And he's like all cold because she was there. So that kind of wraps up the Palladino and the mafia thing. <laughs> excuse me it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the book that character is only set in place because he went to jail for stalking georgia prior to the books the beginning of the book you know prior to the book starting so he's really only there because we think that he's the stalker but then we learn halfway through the book that he literally is not the stalker so we don't hear from him or hear about him anymore that, that deal is done, or not deal, but that part is done. <laughs> All right, so Parker Randolph is the 
son of the network owner where Georgia is going to be working in LA. And the network owner wants his son, Parker, to go to, to um, Aspen to talk to Georgia to try to convince her that, you know, she needs to come to work early. And he doesn't know about all the strangulations that's going on. Parker does. Well, his, the father does know, but he doesn't know, like, how serious it is and how seriously in danger she could be. But Parker does. Parker knows all of this. He's following everything from the news and the tabloids and just everything you know possible he's following this so he does want he he really i'm under the you know we're under the impression that he really likes georgia like this isn't the first time that he's had acquaintances with her like she had a he, they had a whole interview together and stuff and they've been in touch since then and in the in part one my mistake i apologize i said that georgia was taking a six month um break before she went to LA. That is not true. It is a six week. I wasn't sure if it was six months or six weeks and it is six weeks. So I apologize about that. So she's taking time off six weeks to take care of her house in Aspen and wrap all of that up. And the father, um, Mr. Randall wants her to come to LA earlier to get started because they really, they really need her. And Parker, he's an aspiring novelist, so he actually told his father that he was leaving the network so that he can, you know, um, follow his dreams of becoming a novelist. And they have a house in Malibu that he wants to go to and so he can focus on his writing. But first, his mission is to get Georgia from Aspen to L.A. So he, he does come to visit her in Aspen and they have lunch together like he takes the the family jet <laughs> or the network jet to go to Aspen and have lunch with her. And, you know, he just tried to talk to her once about it, about coming back to LA. And she's like, absolutely, I'm not. And then he's like talking, you know, you could be in danger here. There's things happening. You're being stalked. There's a strangler on the loose. Like you should really come, you know, if you don't come back to LA to work, start work early, you should come back to LA to get out of danger. And she's like, I'm fine, you know, I'll be okay, and all this. And then they enjoy their lunch together. And they both are, they seem sweet on each other. But also, Georgia is sweet on Jonathan, the realtor. So she's like, I could see myself with both. But she's very hesitant to start a relationship with anyone because she just broke up recently with, um, a Broncos NFL player, his name is TJ. And, you know, it was a bad breakup. So she's kind of hesitant to really start anything else with, with anyone. Okay, then the story kind of turns a little bit to Bridget and Carlo Ferrari. So Carlo is older than Bridget and they, Bridget is more, is a diva. Um, and they don't really, from what everybody is saying, they don't really seem like they are a couple, like they fit together, but they are a couple and they, you know, they do fit together, but they argue a lot. <laughs> like we learn that Carlo is a little bit controlling, but then also he's got like some sort of mental issue where he blacks out and doesn't know what happens. Like he does sleepwalk, he, and all of that, but he, his mind goes blank and he just blacks out and he can, you know, disappear from himself for an hour, two hours on end. And he has no idea what happened. So they get into an argument and I guess he grabs her by the arm because she's ready to leave him. Like she's tired of, you know, the controlling and not being able to do what she wants to do and, and the blackouts and the sleepwalking and she wants out. So she wants to go back. She's from San Francisco. Whoop, whoop. She wants to go back <laughs> to San Francisco. I have a strong love for San Francisco. I, I've got such a fascination with that city. It's on my bucket list. I will get there one day. Um, so she wants to go back to San Francisco to live. Like that's her home. That's where she's from. That's where her mother is and all of her friends. And Carla doesn't want her to go. And she, you know, escapes his, his grip. And she goes to Jonathan, the realtor, who is a, a close friend of hers in Aspen. And she, you know, she goes to his job and she's, or, you know, the office. And he's, she's talking to him out in the lobby 
where his receptionist or assistant, her name is Margie, and she gossips a lot. So, but she's, but, um, she's, Bridget is telling Jonathan, like, what's happening. Like, Carlos lost his mind. He's very dangerous. You don't know. You don't know him like I know him. Look what he did. And she lifts up her cashmere sweater and you can see, like, the bruise. Like, he did this to you? And she said, yeah, and I could use a Bloody Mary. I could use lunch and I want you to take me, um, so I, we can discuss what's next, you know? And she's, he's like, I can't, I've got an appointment something's come up and she's like please I need your help like you're my friend I can trust you and so he does she convinces him and he's like all right I got an hour so they leave and they go you know to this restaurant to go get the Bloody Mary and lunch or whatever and while they're there he's saying hey you've got to be careful what you say around Margie she's very gossipy and she doesn't know how to keep her mouth shut and she eavesdrops and she's like, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean for it to cause a big issue. And so they're like talking about all of that and what's going on. And um, that's kind of the end of that conversation. And we go back to Dr. Murphy, Tom, who brings a box of books and other helpful information to Georgia. And he kind of pushes his way into her house. Um, you know, she's not ready for visitors. She didn't welcome him in or anything like that. Actually, she encouraged him not to come and that she would come pick up the box. But he was like, nonsense, I'll just bring it over. So he brings it over to her and he sees all of her investigation stuff open and she tries to hide it. Like her laptop is open. So she kind of like goes in front of the laptop and is just talking to him. And he's just so creepy. Like, she's just getting this creepy vibe from him. So she wants him to leave. And eventually he does. He, after talking to her about all of these, like, criminal cases and stuff, he, he does leave. And we skip over back to Liz. I'm telling you, there's so much happening in this book. So many characters. So Liz, the tabloid news reporter, the national tattler, She's talking again to Stanley at, you know, another meal at the restaurant slash hotel restaurant. And he's, they're sitting by the window and he's, she's talking to him, still taking notes, still pretending that she, you know, is from New York. And he, he tells her that, you know, he's like, as he's talking to her, he remembers stuff and he's visualizing. He's like, oh my gosh. You know, he's like talking about the scarf, the Hermes scarf. And so he's saying, yeah, the, I, I sell Hermes scarves because she's wearing a scarf. And it's nowhere near a designer scarf. She's just wearing a scarf. And that triggers his memory. And it's like, you know, I sell Hermes scarves in my, my boutique. He owns a boutique and he sells like designer clothing and stuff like that. And... Then he remembers, he was like, matter of fact, a couple of weeks after Rachel went missing, I sold a Hermes scarf to a man that I recognize was at the party looking at the Hermes scarf. And he's just kind of like drifting off into his thoughts and talking out loud. And then she tries to ask him something out, like, who did you see? And he snaps out of it and he's like, I'm sorry, I probably said too much. I shouldn't talk to you about anything else. And so we're, we're going, you know, we skip back to the serial person of today and he's mentioning, and I, 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 at this point, I, you know, I actually in part one at that point, I was calling him a he cause I mean, you know, so the serial person, he is thinking about Georgia and how she's investigating and how she's got to go. Like she's investigating. She's got to go. She's getting too close to comfort and I've got to like unalive her. Um, and the cop, so the cops think that Georgia is in danger of being unalived. At this point I stopped for a second and I was like, all right, we've got a couple of things here. So I definitely think Eddie is the stalker, um, the actual stalker of from in Denver, like before the book started and then the stalker now. So the one actually taking pictures of her and knowing where she is and following her. I think he, for sure he is that stalker. And then the serial person of today is, in my opinion, either Carlo, Tom or Jonathan, the realtor. 
And I'm saying that because, well, he has these blackouts. He doesn't know what's going on. He can be aggressive. He can be controlling. Tom, Dr. Murphy, because he's just creepy, he studies criminology. He's, you know, he's a criminology psychologist, a criminal psychologist. And he, he, he knows, you know, things and he knows how to, how to do stuff. You know, he studies it. That's what he does. And then Jonathan, the realtor, I think it could also be him because why is he still in this book? <laughs> I mean, he, he did the deed, you know, signed a deal with the Victorian in the house with Georgia and he's not really, you know, he did, aside from taking her out to lunch and trying to sort of make the moves on her, but she wasn't having it. Why do we keep going back to him? Like we, we learn that he has, you know, we, we kind of go into his background a little bit. So we, we learn that his mother used to be like this famous actress in the fifties, like some Marilyn Monroe type stat. Well, maybe not that high of a status, but you know, maybe like a Betty Davis or Greta Garbo type status, you know, back in the day and this Hollywood actress and she's, you know, she's got her condo in Aspen and she asks her son to sell it because she doesn't use it anymore. She's not afraid of the, 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 uh, serialness happening and the strangulations, but she is concerned a little bit for her son, like, you know, but you'll be fine. And then we learn that he has a estranged brother and father, you know, well, his father died when he was a kid, and then he has an estranged brother who he doesn't really see or talk about. Like, why are we learning about this? You know what I mean? So, I don't know. Why is he still in the book? But later on, um, the police go back and they start interrogating and asking more questions <laughs> to some of these main people and they talk to Dr. Murphy and they ask him if he know if he knew Brenda Polowski, the historian at the library. And he's like, no, I don't know her. And he's like, tight. No, I don't know her. And you know, the cops believe that she's lying or that he's lying about it. And we do find out that he did lie. Um, they had appointments. He had an appointment with Brenda a couple of times, like over the last couple of years. And then, these, you know, Brenda's assistant finds out because the police want her to look at Brenda's computer and to see if they can find any contacts or any information and, you know, look at her calendar to see who could be connected to her, her, uh, fatal shooting. And, um, the assistant, she does find, she is able to get into Brenda's computer and she does find her calendar and her appointment book and sees that her and Tom, Dr. Murphy have been meeting a few times this year and in the past. And at the, the last time they met, Brenda left a little note. This is the last appointment. Creepy. Uh, so, you know, we know he's creepy. And so we start getting towards the juice of the book. Well, the end of the book, right? Um, we find out that Stanley Lauren was, well, we don't find out, but we see Stanley Lauren get unalived because uh, the stupid tabloid repro reporter, Liz Kelly, she, I know, every time I was reading that name, I was like, Megan Kelly, like, you know? So anyway, because you hate her. Both of them I do. But Liz Kelly, in the book, she writes the story about everything that Lauren Stanley told her, or Stanley Lauren told her. Everything. I mean, about, you know, him remembering that the, the, the person who came into the shop to buy the Hermes scarf two weeks after Rachel went missing, he, that he saw him at the Winston, at the Rachel's, you know, the part, right? Yeah. Blah, 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 at the Winston home at the party, looking at the Hermes scarves. And remember, Rachel was the first strangulation. Um, it just took longer to find her, her body. 
Greta Moss was the second strangulation, but the first body they found. So Lauren Stanley potentially sold this this serial person the Hermes scarf that strangled and unalived Greta Moss two weeks after Rachel went missing. So uh, Stanley's walking home, you know, from work. He work he a block away. He cuts through this alley and he's gunned down and he's gone. Um, so it's like wow, you know, so. The serial person, he unalive, he gunned down Lauren Stanley, down Brenda Pulowski because she, you know, he was like, well, I can't let her live because she saw me investigating and the Tsume uh, serialness in the 50s. So she could potentially say, I know who this, you know, serial person could be. So he unalived them. They were gunned down. Back at the diner, with, um, no, not at the diner. Georgia, she sees an old photo in some of the news report research on, and she recognizes like a stained glass window or something. And she's like, I know that window. And this, this house that she's looking at in the photo is the boarding house where, and she realizes that it, it's June and Dr. Tom Murphy's house. So again, weird, right? Um, and then Eddie, he was actually fired. Eddie from Denver, the cameraman, he was fired because he's been missing too much work and he's missing too much work because he's not there. Or he takes off. And we learned that, yeah, he is the stalker. I mean, the police officer in Denver put two and two together and, you know, he had his people research his car and to look at the highway and, you know, the highway cameras and stuff like that. And they don't find any Subaru, but what they, but what he remembers is that beat up white van. And it's like, hmm, who does that, who is that registered to? Because, you know, that van is odd looking and he remembers it being odd. So he had a funny feeling about it. So he has the plates ran and it's the downstairs neighbor, his van. So he goes to the downstairs neighbor and he's like, hey, is this your van? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, man, it's gone. Eddie must have taken it. And he was like, what do you mean? And so we find out that Eddie borrows that van from time to time. And they have a deal where if Eddie borrows the van, he leaves the keys to his Subaru. So the guy is not stuck without a car. And sometimes he doesn't even like knock on the door and tell him he's taking the car or ask. He'll just take the van and leave the Subaru keys like in his mail slot or whatever. And I'm telling you, that's like a, that's some crazy relationship <laughs> neighborly relationship they have but hey i guess it works so they put an apb out to um find the because the van's gone and so they put the he puts the apb out on the van and the people working the cameras on the interstate they find the van and was like hey your guy is an aspen like right now as we speak so meanwhile parker is on his way to Aspen because he is worried about Georgia. Georgia's like, there's a storm coming. I don't want you to come. And he's like, well, I keep hearing about these people being gunned down and the strangulations. I'm coming to Aspen because now what's happening is Carlo Ferrari's wife, Bridget is missing and she's actually found gunned down as well. So they think that Carlo definitely unalived his wife, but they don't, they have motive, but they don't have any, like proof or anything like that. So what is going on? Parker wants to get to Aspen to protect Georgia and get her out of there. And so he goes overnight and he's on his way. And um, even after Georgia told him not to. So while all of that is going on, Eddie is basically... He, he made it to Aspen, <laughs> it's nighttime now, and he's definitely, you know, stalking her, and he's looking at the camera, and he hears the conversation that Georgia is having with Mark, the, the Denver police officer. Look, I'm warning you, Eddie is on his way, he's your stalker. No, he can't be. I can't believe this. Yes, he's your stalker. No, he's a good person. We're friends. He's your stalker. Trust us. We know 
He's dangerous. So Eddie hears all of that and sees what's going on because he's got that camera in her living room. And, you know, she's like all freaked out. She's like, I can't believe this. She gets angry and she's got her head buried in her hands trying to just make sense of it all. And she hears something, a creak at the door, but she doesn't see anything. So, you know, she heads into the kitchen to get some wine. And we know this because Eddie's watching. And then Eddie is like, I can't believe this. He sees a figure, a hooded figure on the porch, staring in, trying to get into, um, well, staring in the window, wanting to get into the house. And he pulls out a Hermes, you know, he pulls out a scarf. Eddie doesn't say it's a Hermes scarf, but he pulls out a, what looks like a silk scarf. And he's like, oh, I've got to watch this. Because Eddie was actually on the way to an alive Georgia because he blames Georgia for everything, for him losing his job. Because she befriended him and got close to him and helped him. And then she left. Like she, So he feels abandoned. And he's angry. He Now he lost his job and he's drunk. He's had whiskey. So he's not thinking straight. So now he's angry and he definitely wants Georgia unalived. So he's having fun watching this person with the scarf trying to, you know, peering in the window at Georgia because he knows that the, the current serial person is strangling these women with a scarf so he's ready to watch the show so he's in the back of the van looking at his monitors watching and then you know there's a knock at the door georgia opens it it's the serial person dun, dun, dun. it's jonathan the realtor what Jonathan the realtor. I can't say I was surprised because I called it. I was like, it's either Carlo Murphy or, um, you know, Jonathan. And it is Jonathan. Why? Why is it Jonathan? We don't really know. Like, he doesn't really give a definitive answer. He just basically tells her that he found the scrapbook and he was intrigued by the 1950s serial to May. And he just decided that he was going to be more famous than to May. So he's saying all this stuff, you know, to her. He's got her tied up in zip ties. Her hands are tied. Her legs are tied. But she can talk like he doesn't gag bound her or anything. So he's just talking to her and she's a reporter. So she's like coming up with questions to kind of stall him. Meanwhile, the detectives are all on the way as well as Parker. So it's like very intense. This book got very intense for me. I'm, I'm It's like two o'clock in the morning. I'm reading this and I'm very engaged. I'm visualizing everything like I'm right there with the characters. Um, so the police come up the the local the detectives come into play here and they're like well they've been they've been in play this whole time but they roll up on the van and they're like they're banging on the van because they know it's eddie you know it's eddie's van and they think that eddie is the dangerous one because he's stalking let alone they were on their way to jonathan's house to question him about the whole strangulation thing but they got derailed because they know Eddie is also dangerous and the detective in Denver warned them that he's on his way to Georgia and he's very dangerous. So they knock on the van and Eddie answers the van. He's like, I know you're looking for me. Here I am. But before you arrest me, I got to see the end of this. And they see on the monitor what's going on in Georgia's house. And they're like, oh, my God, is, you know, he's going to he's going to unalive her. Because at this point, Jonathan has the scarf and he's getting ready to wrap it around her neck. So Jack, the detective, he runs. He's like, stay here. And he like runs to the house. And as he's running, freaking Parker comes and he's like, what's going on? And um, <laughs> Jack is like, get out of here. Get out of here. It's dangerous. Get out of here. And Parker stops and gets out of the car and runs up to the Georgia's porch with Jack. And Jack is like, 
get down, please get down. So um, Parker doesn't really know if he's police or not because he knows what's happening, you know, with all of these strangulations and he knows George is in danger, but he can see what's going on through the window. And so Jack, he kicks in the door. It was so easy to kick in that door. He kicks in the door and he shoots Jonathan and, you know, <laughs> Georgia is alive and she gasps, gasps for air. And that's the end of that. Um, that's the end of that. <laughs> and, and so to kind of wrap that up, um, Carlo, he, he isn't mentioned again, but Bridget, Jonathan tells Georgia that he unalived Bridget because Bridget left Carlo. Um, you know, she said she, she, after she told Carlo she was going back to San Francisco, she left him and, um, and went to Jonathan's house and was snooping around and saw this, the scrapbook. So she got in the way. So Jonathan gunned her down and it was the perfect crime because Carlo, you know, got blamed. So it, it, it kind of stalled the police from looking any other angles except for at Carlo. And then we find out about Dr. Murphy and what's going on with him. And yes, he does cheat on his wife. Uh, it, he does not mention that he had an affair with Rachel or Greta, but he did meet with Brenda, but we don't know if he had an affair, but what he, what, what happened at Manhattan, why he retired early is he was actually having an affair with a nurse that was on his staff. And that is a big, huge no, no. So he called it quits, you know, and with, with her and he decided to do an early retirement and move to Aspen, but she blackmailed him for $50,000 and said, I will tell anyone and everyone if you don't give me $50,000 to keep me quiet. So he paid her $50,000, moved to Aspen, and now, you know, she's contacted him again because she needs another, she wants another 10000 So that's why he was so nervous and he told the police that. So that's all out in the open now. So he doesn't have to feel nervous about that. And that's kind of the end of that. And that's, you know, <laughs> where we, where we leave off with the actual book. This was a really interesting book. I mean, all the books I read are really interesting. So I do appreciate you all listening to me and following us and just being part of the Digicast world. I do take book recommendations. I would love your recommendation on reading a book. I know before I said that I, I, I don't really read comedies. I mean, I will. I, I just read, you know, Good in Bed by Jennifer Weiner, and it was really good. It made me laugh. So if there is a book out there that you would like or that you suggest that I read, um, I'd be more than happy to read it and talk about it on Bookmarked. And, you know, just send me your comments, your your questions and all that. And if you have any um, thing else that you'd like to tell me, you know, what's working, what's not working, what I could do better, what I could do less or what have you, please, please, please let me know. I'm very open to feedback and I am I'm I'm very excited and I look forward to bringing you more content. And I really do enjoy this. As I said, I mean, I'm not reviewing the book. I'm talking about the book and my experiences and my predictions and things like that. So I do enjoy talking about the books that I do read. Um, thank you again for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your family, share, all of that. Um, you can find us on YouTube at the Digicast One. We have a blog, it's thedigicast.substack.com. We have a Flipboard, just search for the Digicast. There still isn't much content up there, but it is coming, folks. I Trust me, it is coming. Um, you can find us on Facebook as the Digicast. We're on Instagram as the Digicast. We're on Spotify as the Digicast. And we do have in the description below our Amazon affiliate link. We do awesome things. We do vacation on a budget. We do traveling. We, that is vacation, <laughs> traveling, vacation on a budget. We play board games. We play video games, you know, 
Rob, the other half of the Digicast. He does live streaming on Twitch, everything. We do all kinds of awesome things and bring all kinds of awesome content for you. So check out our affiliate link with Amazon and all the awesome deals and things that we love to share with you. Um, and yeah, so the next book I am going to read is going to be book seven. It is The Patient's Secret by Laura Ann White. Now I have read another book by her and discussed that, The Maid's Diary. You can check that out on this channel. Laura Ann Wright is a very, another good writer that I appreciate, um, new to me. And I or recommended, this book was recommended to me because it's based on a true crime. Again, The Patient's Secret by Laura Ann White is my next book. And with that being said, love the world. <laughs>